me I have Andy Allen. On Starleaf we have the Vice Chair Kelly Armstrong, Mark Durkin, Alex Eason, Sinead Innes and Karen Mullen. Um, I'll just then move then on to agenda item one, which is a ministerial briefing on the local government bill. Members, there's a letter in relation to the bill at page four. Um, the minister is with us this morning to brief us on the requirement for accelerated passage for the local government bill. And then can I then um, offer a very warm welcome to the minister, Deidre Hargy, to the meeting, and also the officials, Anthony Carleton and Judy Broadway. Are also in attendance. Members, just to say that Anthony and Judy can stay on to answer further queries, um, but Minister, I know you've only a short time with us today. So if you could then please begin your briefing on the Local Government Bill, Minister. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chair. You can hear me okay, yeah? Can indeed. Okay, thanks very much. Um, and again, yes, apologies. I have a 9 30 meeting um, with an outside group. So um, I know Anthony and that will stay on. But again, just to thank the chair and the committee for the opportunity just to come along and present this today and the request for accelerated passage for the local government amendment bill. And obviously, most members will be aware of this legislation and what we're trying to do because you would have been on the committee um, last year. And obviously the pandemic and the background for the need to take this through again is the pandemic is still with us. Whilst there are some easements around restrictions, social distancing and those types of measures are still very much in place. And this is continuing to place a substantial impact on local government in terms of delivery of services, but also decision making. And I suppose the necessity around this bill um, is around two areas and two provisions, and that's about remote meetings of councils and also the performance improvement arrangements as well. Obviously, you'll remember back in 2020, April of last year, the department made a flexibility to district council meetings, but there was a sunset clause inserted, so it allowed council meetings to be done virtually. The sunset clause then was running to an end there on the 6th of May this year, thinking that the pandemic would have will come to an end from where we were sitting last year. That hasn't been the position. Um, and obviously with COVID um, improving, councils have continued to, to raise issues. And again, I met with Nilga last week and they've raised some concerns and a request for this to be extended again, just to allow that flexibility and particularly for those larger councils um, with tight spaces in terms of members meeting um, as well. So the bill aims to remove the sunset provision, extending the provisions included in the meetings regulations beyond the 6th of May this year until March of next year. It would enable councillors um, to follow public health advice, obviously on social distancing, but also to continue to contribute in their democratic programme and to make decisions um, at local councils. It also would extend provisions about the manner in which persons may attend to speak and vote and otherwise participate in those meetings as well. And obviously for the members of the public um, are engaging in those also. Um, the bill would also create an enabling party, allow remote meetings to be extended for a further period or even made permanent by means of subordinate legislation, should this be considered necessary or desirable at a future date. Now, I know some of this has been raised also by councils. I know it's been raised by some other ministers um, when I brought this to the executive last week. And I suppose before we done anything definite, we would want to make sure that we engage, that we looked at any unintended consequences. So primarily this piece of legislation is to extend and to have that sunset clause by March of next year. But if there is a feeling to look at more flexibility in council meetings, particularly for those with childcare, those who are travelling long distances in rural areas, we would want to do further engagement and obviously for the committee and the assembly uh, more roundedly um, to have their say and their input into that. So it would just be to give a commitment, uh, particularly around that piece of work, because that would mean a big change. Um, and we would have to do the full consultation around that. Obviously, the timetable of the bill is challenging. Um, there's no doubt about that. But it should be completed uh, prior to summer recess. And then obviously would come into force once royal assent is given. I know there is an immediate issue around the holding of AGMs. And again, this was raised with Nilga last week. My officials, Anthony and co, have been engaging with Solace um, and Nilga and 
it was local councils around remote meetings and councils are looking at arrangements currently in terms of holding those AGMs um, in the absence of the legislation and we're going to continue to work with them and indeed from the COVID monies that was put in if there's an issue around financing or looking at a larger venue then those costs can be covered. The other issue then around performance improvement, obviously the Local Government Act 2014 um, put in place a framework for support for the continuous improvement in the delivery of council services. Again, councils, um, the Local Government Auditor and indeed Solis have raised concerns about difficulties in councils are facing around improvement uh, performance duties placed on them and obviously trying to manage uh, responded to the pandemic and that emergency. So again, to provide councils with some relief in respect of the difficulties that they faced in terms of the delivery of their performance improvement, I had agreed to set aside a number of statutory performance improvement requirements placed on them in the last financial year, um, and it was for that year only. Um, obviously, that requirement was set aside, um, but there was also consultation in terms of the objectives. I mean, previously they had to publish the improvement objectives. Um, they had to have an improvement plan in place, but obviously that was overtaken by the need to just make sure that they were still delivering essential services. So what this bill aims to do is regularise the decision. Um, it would also again create an enabling party, allow subordinate legislation to be introduced to modify council performance and improvement duties uh, for 2021-22 and 2022-23 just recognising the impact that the pandemic has had and will continue to have as we're moving into recovery. Um, but that will only be if it's necessary. And again, that would have to go through the scrutiny and affirmative resolution that the Assembly would be needed. And again, we would assess that as we start to move through into the recovery period to see what last and impact the pandem pandemic is having. Um, a further amendment then is relating to the bill is around uh, section 93 and 94 of the 2014 Act and it places a duty on local government auditor to complete annual audits and assessments on all councils. Section 95 of the 2014 Act provides that the department after consultation with the local government association must determine the councils for which the local government association or by local government auditor will be required to issue an audit and an assessment report in each financial year. So I would propose to amend sections 93 and 94 to make it clear that they are subject to the similar flexibility as in section 95. And again, last but not least, is the request for accelerated passage. Um, I know that it's not something that should normally be done through the committee, um, but I'm sure members will understand or have obviously been engaging with councils or heard the voice of local councillors on the compelling need to look at accelerated passage to allow this flexibility to come in uh, sooner rather than later. So again, just thanks again to the chair and the committee just for the opportunity to come along this morning. Thank you, Minister. And yeah, the committee are very aware of these issues. We did write to you several weeks ago about the issue um, because it was raised to us by our councillors um, about the uncertainty after the 6th of May. We know that most AGMs will be the first week in June. And I also know my own local councillor having to use a theatre to hold their AGM, so it is posing issues. Um, just really, I suppose, want to ask why there has been this um, period of delay in, in, in bringing this forward. And then can I also just ask on the back of that, uh, just a further insight um, around your timetable, um, just on the gambling bill and charities bill, when we expect to see those. Thank you. Yeah, no, well, just quickly, I mean, we had hoped that um, our amendments or proposals could have been attached to legislation that was moving across the water in England. Um, at the last moment, though, we were told that they weren't going to proceed uh, with a change to their legislation for local councils which meant that we had to bring it through ourselves. Now, obviously, that was unfortunate. We don't want to be in this position, um, and that's why we've been having that continuous engagement with Council. So I recognise completely the difficulty that this has left Councils in, um, and we're continuing to work with them, with Nelga and Solace, to make sure that those arrangements are being put in place, and we know Councils are doing that in the short term, and then they allow this to go through if it is agreed by accelerated passage. Um, to make sure that we can get this in then up until March of next year. 
The other issue, sorry, then around charities, and there's papers okay. with the executive at the moment okay. um, on those other issues. So I am hopeful um, with executive approval that we can start to progress those in terms of moving the legislation um, shortly. So as soon as I can get that clarity from the executive, I'll notify the committee. Okay, thank you, Minister. Uh, Kelly, you have your hand up. Bring Kelly in. Don't silent. Sorry, hold on a minute. Kelly, I don't think it's she. Kelly's microphone's muted. Kelly, your microphone's muted. No, not. Oh dear. Oh dear, oh dear. Still on mute. Kelly's own microphone. It's saying on our system, Kelly, that your own microphone is on mute. She's saying it's not. Okay, I'm going to... All right, we'll see if we can sort that out. Anybody else, any questions they want to ask the Minister? Nobody else has their hands up or has anything they want to ask over? Until we can track... Uh, sorry. It. Go ahead. Is that Mark? Chair, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, morning, and morning to the Minister, and thank you uh, for coming with the officials as well. I, I can understand in, in, in this context the, the need for accelerated passage. There are... <laughs> time pressures here, obviously, on councils. I was just wondering, however, in terms of amendments to the local government uh, reform bill, uh, is this a missed opportunity? Is, is there other work needs done? I was thinking specifically around the councillor's code of conduct and, and, and where that was at. Minister, did you get that? It's not work. Oh, sorry, it's working now. Apologies, couldn't come off of there. No, we, we obviously looked at all of these. I mean, there are other improvements that need to be made. I think my view around this, Mark, was to bring it through accelerated passage without the committee or others having due diligence and time to look through any other significant changes that would have a longer term impact wouldn't have been the best way to approach it with legislation that we're trying to bring in in the context of responding to the COVID pandemic. But certainly in talking to some local councils whilst I've been um, out around the place and talking to Nilga, I mean, I've been happy to engage with them around looking at what changes we can make in the time ahead, but that that needs to be done through consultation uh, with local government and indeed um, to go through the normal committee process. So I was just conscious that trying to staple anything on to something that we're trying to bring through accelerated passage for the reasons of the COVID pandemic, that it wouldn't have been a good idea to do that without having the time to have the proper scrutiny. So that was the main reason that I've decided not to bring or try to staple anything else on top of this. No, no, I can understand and, and accept that. But just in terms of consultation, I think there, there had been a consultation on the review of the local government's code of conduct for councillors a couple of years ago when, when, when there wasn't an assembly or executive and, and I was just wondering what, what had become of it or, or when it would be getting brought forward. All of these um, sorry, issues are being looked at um, at the moment in terms of finalising, having a last uh, re-engagement uh, with local government and their representatives as well. So once of a more firm timeline, Mark, in terms of bringing that forward, I'll come back and update the committee on that. OK, thank you, Deirdre. Thank you, and I know, Minister, you need to go shortly, but I think we've got Kelly sorted now. Yes. Kelly, go ahead. Apologies, that was my fault, Chair. Um, I had one screen up that didn't show my um, mute button. Uh, Minister, thank you very much. And I'm delighted to hear that um, there will be future considerations on a hybrid model for specific circumstances for councils. Um, what I wanted to ask you about was obviously the code of conduct that Mark has just mentioned for council councillors is something that would be considered going forward. Is there any other intention to review a code of conduct for senior members of staff in the same way that we have brought in for the assembly? And um, I'm just wondering, there is an issue with um, remote access to council meetings um, the way that those remote or the way that the council meetings are being run varies across each council uh, with some um, just the way that they're run mayors cutting out some councillors the democratic process can be questionable in some areas um, I appreciate it will not be for legislation but is there any intention um, for the department to provide guidance to those councils to ensure that they um, have fair and equitable access to meetings for those who are online 
I think that was one of the reasons, Kelly, why we didn't want to rush anything through that would have a permanent, because again, as you say, you could make a decision that could have an unintended consequence, um, which could actually thwart the democratic process. So we want to take the time. I mean, I recognise, I mean, I was out in rural areas um, within the last week and some are travelling, you know, 40, 50 miles to get to a council meeting. Sometimes those meetings last 10, 15 minutes, depending on what that is. Um, and there's a mixture of feelings. I mean, so you can completely understand the rationale for that or if it's somebody with childcare responsibilities and trying to encourage women into politics and all of that as well. Um, so, but I want to take the time to make sure then that we're engaging, um, that we're going to have that consultation. I think when I met Nilga last week, it's something that they would welcome. And obviously they do want to see a change as well coming forward because I think it has shown that we can do things differently. Um, but again, I know... Th- there will always still be an aspect that that will be face to face in certain contexts and circumstances. So there is a commitment for me that we are looking at this now. We're not waiting on it. We are going to be looking at this now in terms of trying to bring forward a review and how we can improve it and making sure that there is a, a standardized approach in terms of equality and engagement um, across all of the counts. Um, notwithstanding that, you know, different councils will have different um, issues that may arise, but that there's a standard approach in terms of conduct and all of those issues. So, again, I suppose that just demonstrates the need that we do need time to consult and to make sure that we get it right as much as we can. So, again, once we kind of look at this in terms of a timetable and or a review and how we're going to engage, we'll come back and inform the committee because I know in fairness it is something that a lot of members and, you know, the chair has written on um, that just are keen to, to look into more. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, no other member has uh, raised that they want to speak on uh, any further on that. Uh, the Minister, thank you. I know that you need to rush on. Do you have another meeting? Or we have- Thanks very much. Appreciate you being here today. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, again, members, Anthony and Julie are both, both on here as well. If there is anything else, I'll ask you now. Kelly, go ahead. I was just going to say, just Julie and Anthony, is there a possibility just there, the Minister, um, I know she covered quite a bit of what I had asked, but um, we have brought in through the Assembly codes of conduct for... Um, for instance, special advisors and so on, when we had the new decade, new approach. I was just wondering, is there any intentions in your review to have a code of conduct for senior members of staff within councils, just to um, ensure there's a standardised approach to that? Because just we're getting the impression that chief executives um, who are all doing a fantastic job, but there is a governance issue there. um, And I'm just wondering if that's being reviewed. Um, sorry, uh, Chair uh, uh, Kelly, thanks very much. At the minute, the, 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 um, all chief executives, obviously, as you know, are employed by the council uh, themselves. There, is, uh, there are broad guidelines that, that have been issued through the, the staff commission regarding certain elements of recruitment and certain elements of um, uh, discipline for uh, senior members. But... At the minute, as I say, as the employing authority, the, the, the onus sits with uh, individual councils as to the, how they, uh, the terms and conditions and the, the, the report on the actions of individual chief executives. Um, it is something, certainly, I know that through the staff commission and through others, there's a possibility of looking at the broader sense of uh, on the basis of, of, of Roman principles and, and general principles, possibly re, re, um, re-emphasizing those. But it, it, it is, we, we've looked at those obviously in response to a number of specific queries and things, like that, but as it sits at the minute, as a government department, we're not the employing authority. Yeah. And, and, and you know, you have for, for, for members, you, know, you have the assembly and, and, and various other uh, bodies that, that could deal with that. So. It, it, it's a bit tricky. I think probably the minister is minded to look at uh, re-emphasising possibly the, the, the broader principles of public life in, 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 in both behaviour of uh, executives and of um, uh, members of, of councils in the broader sense of, as you said earlier on, how, we tr- how the virtual 
and, and the hybrid meetings are, are, are uh, adhered to. I think uh, the ministers are aware as well of some areas where there, there, there's possibly need to, to re-emphasize again the governance of that, you know, in, in terms of subcommittee meetings and meetings and, and access to the public and access to, to, to many others, uh, and a, a more general push to a more openness and openness and transparency. And that's really why the minister was keen that this is a, a, a an extension a later review of, of whether it should be permanent so, so it'll give the department tank in conjunction with councils to review both the workings of that how it sits with with open and transparency uh, but specifically it, it's it's difficult for the minister to consider the role of, of uh, senior officers of the council as their direct employees of the council themselves thank you i think i agree yeah. with the nolan principles being brought yeah. in um it just seems to be a facet of public life that that it depends on the council that, that they're involved with and that standardization is something i'm very concerned about because most of us in this room um, have constituencies that may straddle a number of council areas and the variation between councils is astonishing for constituents they don't understand it and to be honest it's extremely difficult for us to work through some of the rules for instance with regards or how councils have have taken up how they work with planning, how they deal with the general public um, is now I can understand them having different costs, you know, fees for different things, but the standardized approach is, to be honest, breaking constituents' hearts, never mind our hearts trying to deal with them. Um, I currently have five or four, sorry, um, council areas that fall into my constituency and they're all very different from each other. Um, there seems to be no rhyme or reason to it. Um, it. Just it would be helpful if there was some sort of a, a comparator or a consideration um, made for how difficult it makes constituents when councils make such varied and different approaches to things. But thank you. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Any other member, any question that they want to um, ask before we say? Goodbye to Anthony and Julie. No, nobody else has indicated they want to ask anything further. Then can I just then ask the committee, are you content then that we use accelerated passage uh, for this? I know that we're, we're not overly happy about accelerated passage, um, but in the circumstances, uh, this one cannot wait. So can I ask then, are we content? Yeah. Okay. All right. Look, thank you, members. And thank you, Anthony and Julie, for your time today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, members, we're going to then move on to agenda item two, which is apologies. Have we any apologies for today? No. Okay, then I'll move on to agenda item three, which is the draft minutes. Um, members, you'll find the draft minutes um, for the meeting on the 13th of May 2021 at page nine of your meeting pack. Can I ask members, are you content to agree that the minutes of the 13th of May as drafted? Agree. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll move on then to chairperson's business. Um, members, you'll be aware that the minister um, has established a culture, arts and heritage recovery task force um, to consider measures to support the reopening and recovery in the short term, paving the way for a longer term strategy for culture, the arts and heritage. The committee has received a letter from the department uh, terms of reference for the task force is in your table papers. It is planned that the, ta the task force will deliver its report and recommendations to the Minister for Communities by the 9th of August 21. The aim is that the measures proposed should be practical and achievable and both the proposals and their delivery are to be exercises of co-design. So can I ask members if you have any comment or are you content to note that? Content. Content. Okay, thank you. I'll move on then to agenda item five, which is matters arising. Members, you've been provided at page 21 with a ministerial response in relation to welfare reform mitigation measures. The minister acknowledges the committee's concerns on the outstanding issues and is proposing to bring forward draft regulations to amend the bedroom tax and benefit cap mitigation schemes by closing the loopholes as soon as possible. This will require both primary and subordinate legislation. Uh, members, any comments or content to note, Kelly? 
Um, we, we know that there are people who have already fallen foul of the, the loopholes. I'm just wondering, can we ask, uh, I know that the Minister is intended to bring forward legislation, but what about um, the costs that those people who have fallen, in, you know, have fallen through that gap? Um, is there going to be retrospective payments for them or any support for them? Um, and how many people, if we could just get the details from the department, how many people have fallen through and are now subjected to the full implementation of those um, two pieces, how many um, are in that loophole problem, um, how much is it costing them per week, and will anything be done to support those people? Okay, thank you, Kelly. Any other comments, members, Mr. Bake? Uh, no, then, therefore, can I ask you content with the proposal that Kelly's put forward? Yes? Yeah? Okay. Um, then can I ask if we can move on then to page 22 of your pack, where you'll find a departmental response in relation to the relocation of the Model Engineer Society. National Museums NI has highlighted that it does not have a reoccurring set capital budget allocation, and as such, all capital project bids must be submitted to the Department for Consideration and Approval. One of the 20 bids it has submitted for 21-22 is for the cost of redeveloping the Walled Garden site. From discussions between the department's sponsor branch and National Museums NI, it is understood that the cost of MASNI resettlement will be met from this. Um, sponsor branch will consider the appropriate business case associated with the bid for the cost of redeveloping the Walled Garden site in the formal course of business. Um, members, any comment? Are they content with that response? Kelly? I was just going to say, I know I've spoken to um, the Model Railway people very recently, and I know with good news that they will now be moving to the Drumaway um, Mini Railway site, which is, which is good news, at least that function will still be there. Um, I still have concerns that the amount of money that it will cost to move them will be significant. We're talking about having to use cranes, significant um, plant to transport very heavy materials. Um, I believe that the museum has found a buyer for part of one of their, their track systems, not the raised one, but another one. Um, so they can help to mitigate against costs for any income that they receive. Um, but I'm just wondering if we could ask, I know that it says there that a business case can be raised to apply for the money, but at this stage for them to have included the potential to have to move, um, the um, MSENI um, from the site, um, what is the, the figure that they have come to or they have bid or they're considering and have included in their considerations? Um, because I'm just concerned that it's all talking about the money, it's not actually defining how much it will be. Okay, we can certainly ask that question. I think this is one that we're just going to have to, to, to wait and watch over. Um, uh, for, for whenever that, the, the, that bid is hopefully met. Um, I'm happy enough with that proposal. Any members, um, any other, anything else you want to add to that? Are they happy with that proposal and we move on? Yep, happy enough, okay. All right, members, can I ask you to turn to page 24 of your packs where you'll see a departmental response in relation to post, of, post office card accounts? Bear with me with this one. Um, members will recall we asked for information on any engagement with the Department for Work and Pensions to extend the current contract beyond November 21, and also in relation to the proposed payment exception service. DWP has advised that it is currently negotiating an extension to the contract into 22 with Post Office Counters Limited, and if this is agreed, it will enable more customers to migrate to mainstream accounts before the contract ends. Work is also ongoing on the development of a new payment accept exception service. Um, the proposal is for a payment in and cash out voucher, and will use the Paypoint network to cash the vouchers. Um, encashment through additional outlets is also being explored. It is proposed that the card will be made available for customers who require this new service to access their payments. A vulnerable customer strategy is also being developed, and this will include both pre- and post-migration support for customers. DWP has indicated that a high proportion of affected customers already have an existing bank account which could be used for their pension or benefit payments, and that the new payment exception service will provide a service for those who are unbanked and absolutely need it. 
DWP has confirmed that when the contract ends, no customer will be left without a means to access their benefits or pension payments. Again, members, any comments they wish to add or raise on that, or are they content to note that? Kelly? Just, um, I know last week I had raised it. Um, this is coming forward more and more often now from errors um, where the person cannot have a bank account. So you're talking about somebody maybe who is unable to produce the ID or can't sign their name, all of that, um, and a carer is, uh, has a bank account. Um, we're still waiting for the department to come back to confirm how much they can actually look into that external person, the carer's bank account. Um, and to be honest, the rest of this I can see where they're coming from, but on that issue we need clarification because there's a lot of carers are very concerned about this. Um, in order to help their loved one, they're doing the best that they can, but they're very frightened that they could be accused of financial irregularities or using that person's money. You know, it, it's very concerning for them. There are people who cannot get a bank account, and I'll give an example, a personal one, my brother cannot get a bank account he doesn't have id he doesn't speak he has a learning disability he can't write his name a bank will not entertain him in any way shape or form um his money is received by by my dad but there are other carers who i've spoken to who have said happy enough to use my account but i know that when you receive a benefit your bank account is opened up to for scrutiny but this is my money you know I, i'm only using my bank account to allow this person's money to be you know their benefits to be paid for them um so it's just to get the clarification of how much that external the, the care and the external individual or the family member that their bank account then becomes open to um, the benefit system no, I absolutely get that, and I know from that the letter it says that a vulnerable customer strategy is being developed. Um, so you you would like to think that there has been input put into that from those carers organisations um, to, to highlight some of those issues. Um, it m maybe would be uh, good to ask also who they're consulting with in their vu their vulnerable cu customer strategy, um, in order to to pick up on many of those points you've raised. So we could ask that question as well. Um, uh, that will be DWP, of course, um, but I'm happy enough with, with the, the, your proposal also. Members, any other comments on that or happy with the proposals that have been sent? Hi, Chair. So sorry, to just on that, I, I'd love to know why a vulnerable customer strategy is only being developed now <laughs> when, when, when this policy has been pursued for a few years now and, and uh, impacted adversely on many, many uh, vulnerable people. I, I don't know how, how they're only doing that now, to be honest. Uh, just the, the fact that they've identified that a lot of people affected already do have bank accounts. I know Kelly has asked a question about that. I wonder in terms of what if it's a joint account. And uh, I'm thinking back to welfare reform and, and some of the flexibilities we got around that. But, like, you know, as a potential in it, if they have to use a joint account, could there be people impacted by financial abuse? Potentially, you know, people are, aren't going to be getting the, their own money, essentially, if it, or potentially, if it's going into a, a joint account. Uh, just over the past couple of weeks, I've had one constituent, and, and I know there's probably plenty others out there similarly affected, who did have a bank account that she very rarely uses. This is a woman of, of 86. She proceeded to try and do the changeover and managed to get a digit wrong. Payments have been made, therefore, into an account that's not hers. Uh, the bank is currently trying to, to retrieve them from the person that did get them. But until they do, that money's lost. Yeah, it doesn't make sense at all. Mark, you're quite right that a vulnerable customer strategy is being developed. Yeah, because that we know um, that there are many vulnerable customer, customers who, who, who use these services. Um, and how they didn't know that some time ago is beyond me. Um, so yeah, there are there's further questions need to be asked around there. Um, but I would certainly hope that they are, um, you know, co-designing that along with those many charities out there that that you know fight on behalf of vulnerable people and carers. Um, but yep, yeah, any further questions we can ask? I'm happy with that. Karen, you have your hand up too. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, uh, I suppose just on the supporting the extension. To allow 
customers more time to be able to prepare, particularly coming through this pandemic. So I think that's something if we are already writing to DWP chair, I would propose if we could put, include that to say we, ex- we we support that extension for all the reasons there, even the Kelly and Mark raised as well. Um, we all know how difficult it was before the pandemic to even get a bank. And then if we look at um, rural areas, so I think people need... Um, more time to be able to uh, prepare and have these accounts ready. Yep, thank you, Karen. Yep. Um, any you just further? Go ahead. Sorry, just on that, Chair, I'm not sure how much this extension is for the customer's benefit <laughs> and how much it's for uh, DWP, DWPs, to be honest. It's just going to give another year uh, the, the, the pass to people and the switching over. Yeah, well, there is that point as well. It's probably uh, pretty much true. Um, but I, look, I think all we can do at this stage is we can ask those questions. We can ask DWP um, the questions that have been highlighted here today and also through to our minister as well. Um, I mean, we'll, we'll support our minister in any of the questions she's asking around this also. Um, so I think that is the way forward um, on that. And again, this is another one that is just going to have to have a watchful eye kept on. Um, by the committee. Our members happy enough then with those proposals and then we move on to our next item. Excuse me, so I have one moment, Janice wants to ask. Uh, Chair, just to confirm that we did write on Kelly's first issue last week regarding um, access to, you know, what access yeah. that um, there would be to bank accounts, but Mark has raised then the issue of joint accounts, so we can maybe in- <coughs> go back to um, the department and ensure that their reply covers the joint account issue as well. Okay, members, did you hear that? That uh, we've already written to the department um, on the, the issues Kelly addressed last week, but we could add in now Mark's point there about joint accounts as well. Um, so it's just to update you that a letter did go off last week on the issue, uh, but we'll add to that. Okay, members, happy that we move on? Yeah? Okay. All right, then, can I ask you to turn to page 26 of your PACs, and you'll see a departmental response in relation to SL1, the Social Security Claims and Payments, Telephone and Video Assessment Regulations. Members, although we considered the re- relevant SR on the 18th of March and had no objection to the rule, we had requested a number of further assurances on the matter and discussed the matter on the 15th of April, uh, when we then requested further information on the appeals process. Due to the impact of COVID-19, face-to-face assessments are still suspended to enable the determination of a claimant's benefit entitlement, but the Department is progressing plans to recommence face-to-face assessments as soon as possible, um, as it's safe to do so in line with restrictions. The completion of video assessments is also being explored. It is is explained to these claimants that their participation in a video assessment is wholly voluntary. With regards to appeals, currently eight venues throughout the province have been secured to list benefit appeals for face-to-face hearings. The Minister shares the views of the committee on the issue and is of the opinion that digital solutions should not solely replace existing processes, but instead be complementary to other forms of communication. The Department has confirmed that when the digital technology for appeal hearings was being introduced, a data protection impact assessment was completed, taking into account of customers' needs. And uh, there was communication with the advice sector who represent the uh, applicants to demonstrate the technology. The appeal service offers applicants a choice of type of hearing, and over 60% of applicants who have returned form outlining their choice of the type of hearing they wish to have have opted to wait for a face-to-face oral hearing. Literature has been adjusted to advise applicants who are facing financial hardship as a result of the appeal being postponed to contact the office as soon as possible to make alternative arrangements to have the appeal heard. Um, members, any comments are content to note. Um, I, I just that, that that last paragraph I read out there is, is quite worrying. Where you know where people are facing financial hardship and want a face-to-face um, uh, meeting um, are being just advised to seek an alternative form of appeal. Um, that's not really helpful. So it isn't. Um, whenever they, they uh, are sitting without eating and without uh, electricity and, and the rest, so it puts them into a position, which is not good. Um, Kelly, you have your hand up. 
Yeah, Chair, I'm, I've been doing a bit of work on this this last wee while. There's over 5,000 people are waiting for more than a year on an appeal. Now, we understand the COVID pandemic has thrown everything out, but we have to remember that um, when some, in, in some instances, when, when someone's waiting for appeal, that their claim continues until it hits 12 months and then it stops. So I think we should be writing as a committee to the department to ask them of those 5,000 people, um, it's, it's more than 5,000 people who have been waiting for longer than 52 weeks, how many of them have actually had their, their um, benefit stopped because it's more than 52 weeks. The eight venues has me slightly concerned. Where are those eight venues? Is this still in courthouses? Um, can we just get details on where those eight venues are? Has there been any further work in the appeals service um, moving to more um, friendlier places than courthouses for appeals when, once we come out of this? Um, and has I'm assuming that those eight places um, are fully accessible, um, but it just it would be useful just to get clarification from the department of the accessibility audit that has been completed on those buildings prior to them being picked. No, and that, that's a very good point. I know all of us, I'm sure at some stage, have, have gone to appeals with our constituents. Um, I mean, it, it is already very intimidating for the, for the applicant, never mind having to walk into a courthouse. And to do the appeal, so that's certainly a good point. Um, members, any other comments they wish to make on this? Are they happy with the proposals that have been set out? Yes? Can we move on? Good, okay, content, thank you. Then, can I inform members then that we had written to each department requesting the amount of funding that had been provided to the voluntary and community sector in the past financial years, uh, or past financial year, rather? <laughs> We have a response in this week's pack from two departments. At page 28, you'll find a response from the Department for Education. It says it has provided over £30 million for regular non-COVID funding uh, related and funding to community and voluntary service organisations, um, plus almost £10 million for COVID-19 related funding during the 2021 financial year. And at page 29 is a response from the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. And they say that the total amount of funding provided by the department in the past year to the community and voluntary sector um, was almost four million. Um, then can I ask members any comment or content to note? Content to note. Content to note. So, uh, Chair, I don't want to be a, <laughs> to be a pest to them, but I wonder could we ask them for sort of a breakdown of that, you know, community and voluntary sector is, is broad as well, but if they could break it down a bit more, I'm just conscious then because that will enable us to see as we get responses from other departments and hopefully breakdowns or more detailed responses from, from, from other departments, what groups are getting what, do you think was the, what was, the, what was the point of this exercise? Nope, we can absolutely ask those questions. I'm happy enough with that. Members agreed? Agreed. Okay, members. All right, that is the end of matters arising. Um, just before we move on to the next agenda item, which is our briefing in the budget, I'm just going to, to take a short break um, just to prepare for the next witnesses, okay? Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Okay, members, we're going to move on to agenda item six, which is a departmental briefing on the budget 21 22. Members, you'll find this agenda item at page 31 of your meeting pack. And can I welcome to the meeting Gavin Patrick and Cherry Arnold? Um, Cherry, um, do you want to go ahead and begin the briefing? Um, good, Gavin, good morning, Cherry. Yeah, I never get this. myself right. doing the opening statement today. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll go ahead, Chair, then. So, uh, just good morning, Chair and Committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for myself and my colleague, Cherry, to brief you today on the Department's 2021-22 uh, budget allocation and the DOF commissioned in-year COVID uh, bids exercise. We have provided a written briefing note which sets out details of the Department's 21-22 final budget allocations. This briefing also includes details of the in-year COVID-19 bids commissioned by DOF on the 30th of April, which were agreed by Minister and submitted to DOF on the 7th of May. The outcome of these bids is still subject to executive agreement. Um, I will now provide a summary of the final budget allocation and challenges this presents the Department. And after this, Cherry and I would be happy to answer any questions. As the Committee will be aware, the executive agreed the 21-22 final budget on the 1st of April. And the final budget presents very significant challenges for the executive and all departments with the constrained spending review outcome in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting economic crisis. The department's 21-22 allocations total 876.3 million resource Dale, 224.8 million capital Dale and 38.8 million financial transactions capital. Uh, now, focusing first on the 21-22 resource Dale budget, of the total bids of 302 million submitted, the department was allocated 109.6 million by executive in the final budget. Details in the bids together with the 21-22 final budget allocations is outlined in table one in our briefing paper. The final budget represents a 51.5 million increase on the draft resource position, mainly due to new COVID allocations to enable the department to meet increased demand for benefits and support people back into employment through a range of labour market interventions. Two further allocations for homelessness of 9 million and supporting people of 6 million were also awarded and are to be allocated in the due monitoring round, although as it is guaranteed, spend can and has taken place since the 1st of April. Despite these bids being met, the final allocations present significant challenges for the department and impacting on the department's ability to deliver key public services support COVID-19 recovery and undertake housing transformation in 21-22. It will also impact on delivery of wider executive priorities as set out a new decade new approach and no NDNI funding has been allocated. This means the department cannot progress with any new mitigations to child policy or special rules for terminal illness. Costs for social and language strategies, stadia programmes and Sydney Danes will have to be met by the department if work on these is to progress and no funding for housing, for housing transformation was provided. In relation to the department's resource allocation, the process was aimed to ensure that proposals support and deliver priorities as set out in the department's strategy, building inclusive communities 2020 to 2025. Following careful scrutiny of all spend, including minister's priorities and a prioritization exercise focused on how workloads are aligned to the department's strategic objectives. In allocating the resource budget, pressures of 25.7 million were identified, mainly made up of salaries and general administration expenditure of 13.3 million, housing executive uh, pressures of 3.7 million, IT costs of 2.7 million, advice sector funding of 1.5 million, and social supermarkets of 1.2 million. These pressures have been addressed through 23.3 million of actions proposed to curtail expenditure or mitigate pressures in the year. These include not filling over 12.8 million of departmental staff vacancies in the year, a reduction of 4 million pounds of rate support grant funding to councils in the year, and 2.7 million of inescapable benefit delivery IT costs, 
being met from COVID-19 funding allocations. The vacancy management measures mean that new or additional work cannot be taken on without stopping or reducing other work. Despite taking this full range of actions, um, actions proposed, uh, 2.4 million or 0.3% of the overall budget uh, pressure remains. Given the potential for easements emerging in the year, opening baselines have been allocated on the basis that the overcommitment can be carefully managed down in the year. The department will continue to monitor the position and if necessary, bid to DOF for this requirement in an in-year monitoring round. <clears throat> a breakdown of the department's 21-22 resource allocations is provided in Annex A in our briefing paper. Now turning to capital, the, de the department's 21-22 capital allocations totaled 224.8 million, which is about 10 million higher than in the previous year and also 38.8 million financial transactions capital. This funding allows allocations which seek to deliver on key priorities across the department, such as social housing targets, as well as meeting statutory and contractual commitments. Over planning is a key, to, a key tool to mitigate against the risk of underspending in capital, especially when dealing with single year budgets. Therefore, therefore throughout the year, it will be necessary to replace some of the initial plan projects with a challenge of projects that will deliver the same outcomes. In making the department's internal allocations, an overcommitment of 18 million has been included, and further projects totaling 8.7 million remain on standby in order to maximise spend in a year and to manage this risk. The overcommitment, if required, and monitoring rounds or expenditure slowed if necessary. The Social Security expenditure in Northern Ireland is funded by Annually Managed Expenditure, or AMI, directly from Treasury and HMRC, and is outside the Executive's block grant. The, dis the Department's AMI budget allocation for the year total was $7.4 billion. Total breakdown of the Department's AMI budget allocation, based on forecast requirements, is provided in Table 3 of the briefing. Now, following the exact disagreement of the 21-22 of the budget, there remains some unallocated funding, which has been held centrally pending further assessment of forecasted costs for 21-22. And on Friday, 30th of April, DOF commissioned the first COVID-19 exercise for the year, and a review was then carried out on all unmet COVID-19 bids and pot potential areas of support. Table 2 in the briefing provides details of the Department's COVID-19 bids that were not met in the final budget and the revised requirements submitted to DOF on the 7th of May. A number of minor revisions were made to the previously unmet bids. These were IT Assist laptop support requirements were reduced as the Department of Finance is partly meeting this cost in the year. Social supermarket requirements will be met from a reallocation of funding due to um, the staff vacancies and sports sustainability fund and food intervention requirements have increased due to the revised assessment of need given the COVID-19 restrictions in place. The outcome on these in-year bids is subject to executive agreement. So to conclude, further briefing will be provided to the committee as part of the monitoring round process and other budget exercises as the year progresses as we seek to utilise the budget available. And I hope you find the briefing today informative and Jerry and I are happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, um, Gavin, and I, I certainly <coughs> fully understand um, there are significant challenges ahead. Can I just start off just for a, a point of clarification? Just my first question, um, the, the total of the, the 876.3, um, is, is that, does that include the 109.6 million or is that additional or is that included in that? The resource bids, is it included in the overall total of, of 876.3? It includes uh, all the bids that have been met, um, but not the ones that we are still bidding for. Okay, all right, just want clarity on that. Um, um, so on, on, the, on the COVID bids, no, we're, we're, it's not included in our open budget. Okay, no, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> just then, I um, want to just bring up, at draft budget stage, you advised the committee um, that an urgent efficiency exercises being carried out in the department to look at what could be stopped or paused or done differently. Um, just uh, how has that exercise uh, progressed? Can you be able to tell us any information on that? Um, 
Uh, yes, Chair. Um, in terms of um, the exercise, um, we carried out an exercise right across the department. It identified pressures of 25.7 million. That was mainly made up of salaries and GAA. That included things like um, inflationary uplifts for staff, contractual increases, increases on our increased accommodation. Um, we also had to some pressures in relation to our arms length body, the Northern Ireland Housing Executive. We had additional costs for IT and we had additional pressures for the advice sector, 1.5 million, and for social supermarkets as well too. The exercise that we've done has largely um, identified 23.3 million of actions we're proposing to take as a department. Um, almost 13 million of these actions include not filling vacancies. Um, which is equivalent to around about fu funding for around about 320 posts. It doesn't impact on the universal recruitment that is still underway. Um, we've also too factored in a four million reduction in funding that's going to councils in 21-22 for the rate support grant. It will be revisited in year if we have the ability to do so. We've also too had additional COVID allocations allocated to the department. Um, in the region of 2.7 million um, that are covering off our IT delivery costs. Um, as a result of the work that we've done, we have reduced the department's um, opening pressures to around about £2.4 million, pounds, which is 0.3% of our overall resource budget. However, given the potential for some easements possibly emerging in the year, or we we are operating our open and baseline with this pressure and we will try to carefully manage this pressure down in year. We also too have the opportunity to bid for funding in the in-year monitoring rounds. Um, hopefully that um, assists in addressing that question. No, and thank you. That was very detailed. Um, and uh, the, the only bit probably I would pick on up on is the, the, the staff vacancies part because that is a large, that's a massive amount of money uh, saved. Um, I, I take it that we have, you know, that, that, are com that we're confident um, that that is not going to impede service delivery in any way? No, um, it, it has been considered across the department. Uh, obviously, our core service delivery we're bidding, we've bid for and we're successful in obtaining £24.9 million for the universal credit service delivery. Um, the, the other work we will have to curtail or do it over a long period of time, but it, it won't impact on our customer service delivery. Alec, thank you for that. Uh, Chair, sorry, if I just add, obviously, it does mean that, as I mentioned in the opening statement, we won't be able to take on necessarily additional pieces of work and so on. Mm -hmm. um, could tell, curtail that. And maybe, Chair, well, maybe I, I picked up the wrong number. Whenever you asked me the first question, sorry, the £109 million was well, the opening is part of the opening budget so i thought you meant the the new bids that we're putting through into covid sorry sorry about that so. not a bother <clears throat> no problem Andy, i know you need to leave if there's something you want just to a quick supplement yes. to your point yep. chair and i appreciate that it'll probably not have at the hand but the 320 staff to 15 million can we get a breakdown on that to see exactly where across the business areas that those staff are going to be Good. yeah did you get that gavin yeah or yes we, we, we'll be able to uh, well Try and provide uh, um, an appropriate breakdown for that. We'll we'll come back to you. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, the just one then want to move on then to uh, capital projects within the one year budgets. Um, you had mentioned there in your, in your paper about the over planning tool that is being used to mitigate against um, these risks um, by including projects that can be used to backfill and any slippage. Um, what what types of alternative projects? Um, have you identified that could be used? Well, I suppose one example is in, in urban regeneration areas that you know the, there's a uh, a list of projects that can be taken forward and they can be moved uh, and brought forward. Or indeed, uh, if funding was short, could, could be held back if necessary. But our view would be that we'd be able to bring them forward um, if need be. Um, so obviously, within capital. You're looking more forward more than one year, um, and there are plans in place looking forward into one year. So we we will try and bring those those projects earlier if if if, if required. Yeah, I'm sure there's there's uh, many an idea that most of us could come up with that could be used yeah. for 
for that money so we could as well and just further on that um it's just asking what 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 are what's most at risk in those bulk budget allocations um i know certainly within my uh, my own area the uh, the issue which is an extremely emotive issue uh, is there around the, the 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 tar block strategy and action plan, um, it, it, and I know that is that is a, a large amount of money um, as well, and it is part of it. It's not a one year plan; it's a, a multi year plan, um, and I would be quite happy if that was at risk now, just on for on the record. But um, you know, is, is there stuff like that? Is that being looked at? Um, I don't have the detail of that one in particular with me today, Chair, um, but again, we can come back to you, but certainly I know it's, it is, as you say, a, a priority um, and, and being looked at by the Housing Executive and will be treated as such within any allocations. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a few more questions, but I'm going to open up to members um, and then I'll not be accused of, of stealing everything. So I have Alex first and then Kelly and then Mark. So Alex. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, just a few wee questions. Um, the, the the increase in your your overall budget um, would most of that increase? I think it's one hundred and nine million, if I'm right. Would most of that all or the vast majority of that be because of the the COVID pressures? That's my first question. Um, my second is taking those COVID pressures out that this potential increase is, how much of an actual increase have you actually got? If you take that out, if you know what I mean. Um, my second question is, um, is funding for community groups for the Lexus Spa neighborhood renewal and areas at risk, um, have, have, have they all stayed the same or has there been an, a, a decrease in that? Um, so we came to hear about that. And um, I was a wee bit concerned about you to pay for funding for food interventions, and um, um, I was wondering um, that that seemed to be zero. So, if I'm wrong in that, can you correct me? Um, and it's something um, that I think has been extremely vital over the last year and a bit. So, um, I would be keen to see if anything can be done. Um, because I think it's quite vital at the moment as well, because uh, just the way things are. Thank you. Okay, um, Alex, I'll take the first part of your, your question. Um, in terms of the 109 million, it included um, 42.8 million that was allocated for our existing welfare mitigations in the current financial year. So that's largely to continue with um, social size criteria, otherwise known as bedroom tax, and to our benefit cap. We also, as part of our COVID-19 recovery, bid for $24.9 million for our additional universal credit recruitment, which we met in the final budget allocation. It included $26.8 million for new labour market interventions. That includes um, the launch of Job Start. And also, too, it includes £9 million for homelessness and a further almost £6 million for support people um, in the current financial year. Um, so, um, with the exception of the 42.8 million for mitigations, the remaining funding allocated is all being allocated for COVID. Okay. Okay. And then, just coming in on, on your other two points, um, Alex, just on the, the community and voluntary, you mentioned neighbourhood renewal. Uh, those those uh, lines have been protected, so they uh, have carried forward from uh, previous year. There's been no reductions in those lines. In relation to food interventions, um, we do have the um, the bid in for COVID funding um, of, a, of a million pounds, and that's uh, still subject to executive agreement. Um, and again, as you mentioned, it, it's been that has been a crucial element of the COVID response. And there's, there's about fourteen and a half million in the in previous year um, on that. Obviously, a lot of that was in the first part of the the pandemic. Um, uh, tied in with that, we have the, the social supermarkets. Um, and um, while we, we've been able to fund that from our um, baseline funding uh, and, and welfare funding, so there is, there is funding available for social supermarkets for this year. Okay. okay. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Kelly? Kelly? 
Kelly, we can't hear you. Can't hear you, Kelly. Apologies, my fault again. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Gavin another difficult year again. Um, I have a few questions for you. Um, FTC, um, on the amount that is, is awarded, is there enough to administer social housing targets? Yes, we're, con we're, we're content for the, the funding that we've received in FTC for the um, Housing Association funding that we were able to re restart in, that, in the last year. So we're, we're content with that initial allocation for that. Okay. Um, just to pick on Alex's point before, when the allocation for um, food that we know has been so important throughout the COVID period, um, I've noticed that it says that social supermarkets, while it hasn't been allocated or it hasn't been successful in the bids made, um, that you're hoping to find that million pounds um, from within um, the savings that are made from, from not recruiting staff. Um, I'm just wondering, is... A social supermarket, to be honest, um, I've taken a look at this and, and the help that they can provide people. Um, in fact, all of the banks do this, but um, in particular, social supermarkets have an option to help people um, come out of poverty. I'm just wondering, that million pounds, I'm assuming, is just to keep things as they currently are with the existing number of su social supermarkets as opposed to developing them? Yeah, there have been previous plans to roll out the model, um, and obviously, uh, due to the pandemic, that, that didn't happen last year, um, but it's now the intention uh, to take forward the co-design work with councils and other stakeholders to agree how best to expand the model across 11 council areas and implement that in year. Okay. Um, I'm really disappointed that the Minister had bid for um, the money f um, for people to be able to access um, PIP who have terminal illness, you know, and it's sped it up way. We know that Westminster hasn't taken it forward. Um, it's under £2 million. Um, is there any potential that, like social supermarkets, something can be found in year to, to make up that money? Or is this out for another year unless there's additional June monitoring round or later monitoring round money found? Um, yes, Minister is very committed to, um, to bringing this forward, you're correct. We had bid for £2 million, and that £2 million would have covered six months in the current financial year. Um, however, there is a requirement now to bring forward um, legislation, and it's unlikely that we would incur spend in the current financial year due to the, the lead time required for the legislation. We are, um, at the minute, within the department, undertaking policy development and analytical work in terms of special rules. Um, however, any changes, as I mentioned, will require primary legislation through the Assembly and funding discussions too, which will need to be had with Department of Finance, Treasury and the Executive. Minister has indicated, however, that once the necessary approvals have been secured, she will announce the way forward. And we're hoping, of course, that Westminster maybe in a future budget changes their mind and, and brings it in so it would come in under AMA as opposed to um, basically a, a welfare mitigation that we're having to take on ourselves here. Yeah. Um, yes. I just want to, well, on the children, the child funeral, absolutely, when a family hits that, I don't know how they cope with it. But I was just wondering, is that a duplication of the Department of the Economy's proposals or is it for communities to pay that? Um, I just wondered, I know that it's in there as well. Um, well, as an interim measure, local councils had agreed to voluntary waive um, certain fees um, in relation to um, child funerals. Um, obviously, we've bid, to, it wouldn't be a duplication of the economy scheme. We bid for 700000 um, to establish a child funeral fund in the current year. Um, department officials are still working on the development of that scheme, and we will be submitting an in-year bid in the joint monitoring round for that funding. Thank you. Um, I'm just thinking as well, the Minister is committed to um, working through legislation to close the welfare mitigations loopholes, but there doesn't seem to be any bid involved here at this stage um, to cover the costs of those for those people who have fallen into the loopholes. Um, would you be hoping that if the Minister does take this forward later in the year, that, that there would be maybe money down the back of the sofa during one of the monitoring rounds to cover that amount? So we had the cost of um, closing the loopholes included in the £42.8 million that we bid for and was allocated for this year. And that will allow those loopholes within benefit cap and social sector size criteria schemes to be closed. Um, obviously, it's a priority of our minister to bring that legislation forward and the department's working on that at present. 
Okay. The final one I have, and sorry, I'm asking a lot of the bitty, bitty questions of you. I'm a little bit concerned about the disabled facilities grant through um, the housing executive. There doesn't, and maybe I'm reading this wrong, there doesn't appear to be money set aside for that this year. Does that mean that there wouldn't be that type of work coming forward? And it does look like um, for the housing executive, um, I'm looking at, and I'm maybe picking this up wrong, on table one, the resource bids and allocations. Um, like the housing executive's regional revenue pressures, there has been no allocation for them. Um, I'm just wondering what impact that will have on the disabled facilities grant and maintenance. Um, just checking that. Uh, sorry, sorry, which table was it you were referring to? In I'm just wondering on table one where it says number three, the Northern Ireland Housing Executive regional revenue pressures, there was a bid okay. made no allocations and I'm just wondering how that then affects the operation of the housing executive uh, because so, there are other things like maintenance and the disabled facilities grants um, for the adaptations to houses. Okay, so um, when we re when we had another look through and the housing executive provided their, their pressures um, and when we took into account that when we got the final budget, the pressures they, uh, indicated at that stage were 3.7 million. Um, and when we looked at the saving measures, we were able to introduce, uh, we were able to cover uh, two point seven of those pressures, um, and therefore uh, asking the housing executive then to, in a similar way, I guess, as the department is, is looking to to um, max, maximise use of our, our budgets for the housing executive to do the same um, and look at their savings proposals. Um, I and therefore I I would. Say at this point that they should be they should be prioritising their spend, and as she said, disability adaptions would would I would have thought be a priority for for, for the housing executive and the board to, to take forward. Yeah, and just a final one is um, the resource bids um, table two for the COVID recovery. Um, oh, please, we need this so badly. Um, when do you think that we'll get news on that? As take that to the executive. It's, it's, it's for the executive to make a decision um, and we, we presented our bids and obviously we would hope to hear that as soon as possible. But uh, um. Yeah, I think we all do. Um, it's a tough year this year. Um, uh, here's hoping that, that, that at least that COVID recovery and the updated bids can come forward. Thank you very much and thank you for answering all my questions. Okay, thank um, you. Thanks, Kelly. Um, then can we bring in Mark? Thank you, Chair, and thanks to Gavin and Jerry for uh, coming along with this uh, report today. Uh, a few of the points I was going to make have been made, but just in terms of the mitigations, the new welfare mitigations, 57.65 million that hasn't been made, what was that to be, given that there's the, the two-child rule and the terminal illness are separate? Yeah, so Mark, we originally had submitted a bid for 147 million. We did reduce it because of lead time for legislation um, in year to the 57.5. That was to bring forward a range of new mitigations that was in line with the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission report. And it included um, bringing forward cost of work allowance, additional payments for carers, um, a best start grant, additional payments to children and low income families, additional payments to offset disabled people and low-income houses. Um, you see contingency, also too, we had in child offset in the two-child policy and administration costs. Um, these mitigations are not affordable within the department's final 21-22 allocations and would need executive decision. There is, um, obviously, at the minute, the department has prioritised its response to the pandemic. Um, however, is planning to take forward a mitigations review. The review will be taken forward by an independent panel and it will make recommendations on a future cost of prioritisation e exercise. It will need to go back to the executive, obviously, too, for consideration in terms of funding. OK, uh, thanks, Chair. And to Chair, uh, talking in terms of the benefit delivery response and use is the for the universal credit jobs that I, that I always harp on about every time you're in, that, that that recruitment is currently underway. Do we know what stage that's at? Because I know a number of people who've got a letter to say, yeah, you've been successful, uh, but it doesn't say when, when the department will be back in touch, when they might be starting. Has anyone actually been recruited yet? 
uh, they have, Mark. Um, so obviously you're correct. We, um, to administer the significant increases that we've seen really in our caseloads, we have um, progressed recruitment of an additional 900 staff and that is underway. The initial recruitment exercise it launched in October. However, it was impacted by COVID-19 restrictions that have been in place from December, and that as a result has delayed the recruitment. To date, the department has recruited 367 new staff, and a further 158 successful applicants are currently going through their offer and their pre-appointment checks. To, obviously, in terms of affordability, as I've mentioned, the department had bid for the the cost of that recruitment in the current financial year, and we were successful in receiving 24.9 million to cover the staff, cost of the staff and the additional IT required. Um, at the minute, sorry, at the minute I'm too, not. just to let you know, um, recruitment competitions for key management grades A1 and A2 have launched. Um, the departments welcome this launch, obviously, because there's been no supply at these grades. However, um, I, I should just note that um, whilst it's launched and we have welcomed that, it's unlikely supply will be available before late summer um, or possibly early autumn and that any delays of this could potentially put at risk our ability to spend the full budget in the current financial year. So those that have been recruited, they've started and all? Um, yes, there's, um, I, as I understand, there's 367 have been recruited and started. No, 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 that's that, that's good news. Uh, with regards to the supporting people, see that the bid there was met for five point nine nine million. However, there was a bid, the inflationary bid, as well, which is nearly six and a half million. Could, that wasn't met. Could you talk me through that? The five point nine nine is that the standard ring fenced supporting people budget, and therefore, if the inflationary bid is bigger than that. Are we saying or seeing that supporting people is getting less than half the money that it actually needs? Um, so if I take that one, uh, the supporting people budget is actually um, just short of £73 million. Oh. Um, uh, the inflationary bid was a bid to, um, to uh, I suppose, realign the the budget because um, there hasn't been inflationary um, increases over the past number of years. Um, so that was the basis of that bid, uh, which hasn't been met. Um, however, the bid that has been met, the, uh, the six million five point nine, um, is for COVID and, and the additional pressures uh, that supporting people program will face and is has been facing because of the of the pandemic. Okay, thanks, Gavin. And I, I see there there was a bid for housing transformation that's not been met. There's the housing staff, they deliver on the NDNA, that hasn't been met. I just wonder then in terms of the, the, the work, the, the big job work that needs done in that regard as set out by the previous uh, minister, what are, what, what are the ramifications for it? So we have um, been able to fund that through our the, the proactive measures that we the savings proposals that we took. So we, we funded the, the staff, both in the housing staff to deliver NDNA and the housing transformation um, for for this year. Um, that five hundred thousand for housing transformation is I suppose the, the initial work that needs to be carried out. Um, and uh, for example developing the business case um, future years um, the the, the need for funding there is, is much greater, um, and that will obviously we will obviously bid for that um, in future year exercises. So, the, the work the work is being taken forward, but we've had to make savings propose our savings elsewhere to be able to fund that within our baseline. Okay, uh, th thank you, and, and then finally, uh, it's in the COVID recovery, but I think so. I can't find it right now, Gavin. But was it the grants to councils, the seventeen million? It hadn't been met. There, there's possibility, I suppose, that that could come through with more COVID money coming from London. I guess, yeah. Or uh, what's the well, well, that, is that not yeah, that? So um, councils received uh, eighty-five million last year, um, and uh, they were able to, to keep all of that to, because of the crucial work that they have carried out in the, on the front line uh, during the, the COVID. Um, and the 17 million was the, the remainder of, of funding that they felt they required uh, for this full financial year. 
um, at this stage, we, the bid is in, but um, it is for the, the exact event assess the bids across all departments, whether or not that, that funding comes forward to us. So okay. we're awaiting that decision. Okay, well, thank you, folks. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Mark. Um, just to follow on from what Mark was saying there, I mean, it is concerning that those um, COVID recovery bids, when look at even culture, arts um, and heritage recovery, um, sports recovery, all of those, all of those things that are vitally important as well. Um, just you know, so what, what sort of impact will that have um, overall if those bids are not met? Um, well, I suppose where, where we were able to provide funding in last year, the, the funding ha has stopped for, for this year. So um, uh, in the recovery for arts and sports in those sectors, there wouldn't be any further uh, COVID funding schemes for the, the organisations that are obviously facing difficulty. Um, um, hence, we have placed these bids and uh, the Minister has, uh, has been clear of the need to, uh, to uh, get funding for these. But as I say, these are being considered by the executive across, across all departments all, and all the pressures facing um, all departments, um, um, but we have, we have flagged them from our from our departmental point of view. No, oh, and I, I, I'm sure the executive has numerous bids, and I know all departments will be um, fighting their corner. Um, but I know certainly we will be supporting our minister and fighting her corner as well for for her department. Yeah. Um, no doubt about it. Uh, members, any other further questions, Andy? Yeah, sure. Just just one very quick one, Gavin. Um, in relation to the MDNA bids, um, thirty and thirty-one sub-regional and regional stadia. What what's the current position with those? Um, are they unmet? And what are the ramifications? Sure. We, we didn't receive any uh, specific funding for th those two bids. However, again, similar to the housing transformation, um, it was recognised as a priority um, for the minister and. Um, uh, we have fund, funded those, uh, which are basically staffing costs to, to take it forward um, from our existing baseline through the savings proposals that we put in place. Okay, both of those are funded? Yeah, both, both regional and some regional. So the staffing costs required to take forward the work this year, um, uh, the funding has been provided for those staffing costs. No problem. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thanks, Andy. Any other member want to ask any questions? Um, don't see any other hands up. At present, no. Okay, no, no further hands are up to ask any questions. Look, um, Gavin. Sure, uh, sorry, well, uh, Andy always I has one last one. Um, <laughs> Gavin, just, just, um, it'll come as no surprise. So, regional, is, is there any intention to look at in our in year uh, bid in respect to sub regional, bring it forward, or is that still not the case? Is it going to be uh, later on in, in the beyond the assembly mandate that we're currently in? Well, I know the, the, the team are still working through in the sub-regional. If, if they get to the point where uh, um, that they can take the project forward, we, we, will, we will bid for it or reassess our, our current capital allocations again, as I mentioned, if there's an assessment. So um, at this point, um, there, there's no, no funding in, in this current year for the sub-regional, um, but it will be continually reassessed as the year goes on. Okay, and, and just in terms of FTC, and I know you touched on this with, with Kelly's question, is there any consideration within the department of, of increasing the bids around F, FTC to increase the, the housing output? <clears throat> Um, we FTC is certainly we, we have been uh, looking at to see if we can avail of more of that type of funding, um, and it's something that we will continue to. Um, at, at the moment, um, given the uh, the ability to actually spend in the year, we're, we're content with the opening budget, but as the monitoring rounds um, and the June monitoring round, which is, is currently underway, um, we're, we're considering all those options. Um, and uh, again, if necessary, we'll, we'll bid for further further funding. Thanks, but I guess we want to make sure that we're realistic in what can actually be delivered um, as well. So at, at the moment, we were content with the original uh, allocation. Okay. Sure. Hold on, two texts. Are you finished, Andy? On this time, sure. Thanks. Okay, Fra, come on, go ahead, Fra. First of all, I'm sorry, I, I'm having serious problems with uh, my computers, and uh, I have to get up to assembly and get somebody to have a look at them. But uh, uh, thank you for per your perseverance in this. But uh, just just picking up on a number of things, there are quite a number of bids that have went in. 
and obviously rest with this executive as a whole. And it would be interesting uh, to, to maybe even get a report on that, uh, why there's a delay. Because in, in many ways, uh, through running through it, the, the, the whole assembly, uh, communities uh, provide uh, many life-changing programs uh, and uh, the bids are essential, not only for the, the continuity of them programs, but also to take you out the end of what has been a terrible year uh, for everybody across the north. So is there a possibility that we could write the executive asking them uh, for, for a breakdown of the bids and, uh, and what, what if any uh, delay there's been and why? Um, I certainly can I would seek advice on that and see if we can do that. Um, I don't know if, if uh, Gavin or uh, Cherry have anything, if they have that information, you know, that detailed information. We, we would have, a, we would... Sorry, I was going to say it would be for the Department of Finance really that collate that information rather, rather than ourselves. So um, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't have the, the, the visibility of. Um, of all the bids across uh, the other departments that uh, we would sorry, be able to share. Sorry, sorry, Kevin. I'm just talking about from the bids uh, from uh, the Department of Communities. As I, I stated, uh, communities is uh, in many ways a life-changing department uh, dealing with the most uh, the most difficult and uh, underprivileged people and the things. So I think it's important that we get an understanding and if there is any difficulties with the bids that are getting what they are. We, we, we're happy to provide a summary of the bits that we've submitted um, yeah. and uh, where there's been delays and obviously flag those or where funding hasn't been allocated. If that's, uh, yeah. that's helpful, we'll do that. That would be excellent. So it's and I'm proud, I, I agree with you, and I said it there earlier. I mean, we, we, we know as a committee, because we, we're right in the middle of this committee, we hear, we've heard so many witness sessions, we hear from, from our own constituents as well, just how important a lot of this work is that this, that this department does. And I have no difficulty in supporting the minister um, uh, that when, uh, uh, taking any of these bids through. The executive and I think our, our committee. I mean, that's what we're here to do. We're here to support her as well as scrutinise. Um, do I have no difficulty with that for either? So, no, to see, see, just one final thing on it, and I know you do. I know that uh, that the, the rest of the committee uh, so supports it on it. But I think uh, we we have to continuously recognise it. And, and this minister, we have a minister who gets it, who knows the under, uh, knows the importance of, uh, of, of of moving this all forward, and. Uh, why it's in housing, why it's in benefits, why it's in the community development sector. She's been there, seen it, uh, done it with a T-shirt. So I think that, uh, and, and for her department also, I think the, the last year for everybody has been a very large learning curve and hopefully we're coming at the other end of it. So I think we, 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 we obviously need to, uh, as much as possible to say to the department, well done, uh, you have done a good job under difficult circumstances. No, I agree. I agree with you, Fra. Absolutely, there has been it has been, you know, monumental the work that has been done um, throughout this department during COVID, um, and we I certainly recognise that. Um, <coughs> Cherry, Cherry, or, or Gavin, anything further that you want to add? Picking up on any of Fra's points or anything else? No, not, nothing at this stage uh, for me. Maybe Cherry does. Yeah, no, not, nothing further to add. We'll come back on the on the queries raised on both the staff posts and a summary of our bids. That's grand. Thank you very much. Okay, no other members has indicated to come in. Um, so you've been given plenty of time to raise your hand, and you haven't. Uh, so can I then just thank um, Jerry and Gavin for your time with us today? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, members, we're all back in the spotlight now again. All of the members. Um, so I'll move then on to agenda item seven with your permission, which is correspondence. Um, you'll find the correspondence memo at page 41 of your meeting pack. Can I draw your attention to page 49, uh, which is a departmental letter regarding the housing supply consultation call for evidence. The project team has asked if members have any views at this stage. Um, so can I just ask uh, members, have they any views at this stage? 
or, okay, nothing there at the moment. Then can I just ask then, members, are you content with the, the, the memo as drafted, or is there anything you want to bring up under correspondence? No content? Okay. All right, members, we move on to agenda item eight, which is our forward work program. Members, next week's meeting, we will receive a briefing from the Independent Review of Charity Regulations Panel, and also two briefings from RAISE, one on sport and disability in Northern Ireland, and the other on female participation in sport and physical activity in Northern Ireland. Um, the department has also made us aware of another pensions-related LCM that we will have to consider before summer recess. It's on the Westminster Compensation London Capital and Finance PLC and Fraud Compensation Fund Bill. Um, the department has advised that there is a tight timescale on this and have asked if officials can brief at the meeting at next week, the 27th of May. Are members agreed with our next week's meeting? Good, all agreed. Okay, I'm glad you all agreed to that because unfortunately that will mean another 9.15 a.m. start. I didn't want to tell you that before you agree, um, but because uh, it would have been 10, but because the department need to come in and brief us, uh, it would it would be a little bit tight possibly. So um, then, uh, so I'm hoping then the week after we can move to 10 a.m. I don't say it because goodness knows what will happen between now and then. Um, so then, members, as of last week, um, can we get agreement from the committee that we stay on after the meeting again for a very short closed session just to confirm a forward work programme up to summer recess based on the discussions we had last week? Agreed? Okay. Good stuff. Agreed. And then going to move us on to agenda item nine, which is any other business. Can I ask, has anybody any other business they want to bring up at this stage? No. Nope. Okay, that's yeah. right. Sorry, uh, just, just one thing that I thought of it there when we were chatting about staff required for this housing transformation a process that, that so badly needs done. And currently, there's no housing degree available in Northern Ireland or, or, or on the island at all. I think uh, it might be worth, or I, I don't know, could we as a committee write to the, the department and ask for, for their view on that? Yeah. You're not having people now doing housing specific degrees, and I think we're going to need people with those particular skill sets, particularly as we embark on this massively important piece of work. Okay, we can get more information on that and certainly ask those questions. Yep, happy enough with that. Sure. Yep, go ahead, Frank. See, it's, a, it's a very interesting uh, proposal that Mark has made. You know, it's been a number of years since there has been. Uh, any degree available, and I, and it, I think what it has done is that in the, in the past there was a constant flow of people who were coming out for the de degrees that made up future housing management uh, across the north, and most of that has been, I'd say the vast majority has been lost. Lost. I can never understand why the University of Ulster cancelled the, the, the degree in the first place, uh, because you, you you had the occasion to meet many people who were going through. Uh, their, 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 their degrees, and I think all of us as MLAs uh, had participated in question and answer things. But that, that, that just went by the by. And I think we've done people at the service and uh, go back all them, 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 them years ago. And, uh, and we, we, we need to also count maybe uh, when we get this information back, if Matt agree, or Mark agrees, that uh, we look at contacting the universities and ask why. As far as we're concerned, in terms of housing, such an important aspect has been uh, just permanently dropped from their 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 their, their agenda. It is interesting. No, I, I agree. Go ahead, Mark. I, I agree with that proposal, a uh, supplementary proposal entirely. I know this is beyond the the minister or, or the department for communities, but it was just to see what we can get back from the department in terms of their view and on yeah. how this yeah. is going to be a, impact the, the the workforce. Yeah, it's, it's, also, it's a bit strange, especially when we use our universities to do various research pieces when it comes to housing um, here in Northern Ireland, and yet we, we don't have that that degree path um, within them. So, yeah, uh, and it, just, it wasn't something that actually I, I thought of. Kelly, do you want to speak on that point? Yeah, it's just on that. I think that we we may need to widen our consideration on this to include the further education colleges. Um, no, I'm probably going to say the name wrong. The north, northwest or north. 
Regional College Northwest, um, yeah. have been doing it. North Wales. Is it Northwest? It's, um, basically, they have been doing fantastic work looking at retrofitting houses um, to make them um, carbon neutral in the years ahead. And, and they're training up amazing young people in these new technologies. So um, there, there's a different... I know that we're talking about housing strategy and housing policy, but let's not forget that there's actually practical information coming through. I'm more concerned that there's there's a lack of consideration on future proof and the it might be worthwhile if we could maybe write to um, the Royal Ulster Architects Society to ask them, you know, what is what is the developments that are happening that they would like to see because they help to advise the universities on the design and, and, and what new houses need to look like going forward. But I think that we need to reach out to the further education institutions because they seem to be picking up where universities have, have stopped providing those type of degrees. Okay, no, thank you, Kelly. Yeah, we'll do that also. Remember, any other on this point? I know Robin's waiting possibly to come in on something else. Robin, do you want to go ahead? Robin, you're in silent. Your, your device is muted. Can you try again? Okay, we're still muted for some reason. Right, well, Robin has it muted. We can't. It, it's saying on our screen that it's your device that is muted, Robin, not ours, because we've got everybody on spotlight here at the minute. The joys of technology. Try again, Robin. No, still can't hear you. Still can't hear you. So we can't. No, it's not working, Robin, I'm afraid. I'm sorry, we can't seem Ask to hear you. Sorry, say again. Ask the email us. Yeah, do you want to... Uh, well, you can email us through if you want. We we are still on here for a little while longer. Um, but uh, to see, if, or to put it through your, your question, Robin, there's not a problem, or, or message me, either or. Um, I'll, I'll highlight it. So I will. Um, it's just, again, the joys of technology. Um, yeah. Sure. Chair, Sorry, go ahead. Just on the housing matter that, that you were talking about, the housing degrees, just as really as a reminder to the committee that we heard from the UK Collaborative Centre for Housing Evidence at the planning day last September. Okay. Which if, um, Ken Gibbs spoke to us, he was the co-director. So there is a UK-wide Collaborative Centre for Housing Evidence. I don't know um, how strong the links are with the NI universities. We could check that We could out. check that and ask uh, maybe ask some questions of them as well. Yeah. yeah. No, that's fair enough. Sure, can I, can, I can, can hear you now. I can hear you now. Right, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know what was going wrong there. It's the point that, uh, indeed, uh, Kelly was just in ahead of me. Uh, I do know that, uh, and this would be going back uh, probably a couple of years, that the Belfast Metropolitan College were looking at the potential of them becoming a degree awarding uh, college. Uh, I, I happen to think that uh, much the same as others that housing is of such an importance but it is a, it is a qualification that has a great deal of portability um, and opens doors for, for, uh, for, for those who, who, who take that degree but it might be worth chair uh, in terms of the overall colleges uh, approach uh, really raising the query with them as to whether or not there is the potential for them to uh, work towards the establishment of a degree within colleges uh, as opposed to perhaps asking the university to uh, bring back a degree that they, they had already uh, dropped from their curriculum. Um, that probably does mean uh, work for the university, for the colleges, but it, it can be both a practical degree uh, and a very conceptual degree. No, thank you, Robin. Um, yes, I think we do need to direct to several people on this um, to try and get that information together. And, and then when we do get that information together, then we can then um, also write to, to the Department of Economy um, as well as to, to, to how this gets progressed. No, look, thank you for bringing up those issues. Any further AOB, anybody wants to ask? 
or any other issues they want to highlight? Nope, we're all right, yep. Okay, then I'll ask you to move on to agenda item, item 10, which is date, time and location of our next meeting. Our next meeting will take place next Thursday, the 27th of May, at the lovely time of 9.15am here in room 29. Members, please stay on the line and don't be disappearing off because we're going into closed session. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.